give this talk. Um, um, Trish and I were, were talking about um, um, some of the underlying uh, mechanisms of nitrogen fixation and how a lot of us took, uh, took a class in biology or, or plant physiology in college and, and a lot of times we just kind of briefly go over that, but it's really such an important part of, of agriculture. So, so this, um, this talk was, uh, was, was written in a way to kind of give the, the basics of the mechanism. So there will be a lot of information about the, the biology and, and then um, a little bit at the end about what we're doing here at the ARS to try to improve um, nitrogen fixation. So uh, the slides, they may be technical at times, and, and I, my assumption was that you'll be able to go back and see them if you, if you would like in the future. So um, what we'll talk about today is uh, who fixes nitrogen, uh, the types of bacterial nitrogen fixers. Um, we'll focus mostly on legumes, uh, nodulation, and, and some of the relationships that occur in those species. Um, a little bit about how we measure nitrogen fixation, and then, um, like I mentioned, some ways that we're working on improving nitrogen fixation. So uh, some fun facts about nitrogen is that um, about 99% of the nitrogen on Earth is unavailable, and that's either uh, unavailable to plants, and that's either in, in the form of gaseous nitrogen in the atmosphere, or in some cases, or in, in, in many cases, nitrogen that's locked up in organic matter in, um, in soils. Um, and this, this gaseous nitrogen, what, which we'll call N2, and that just means there's two nitrogen atoms bound together, uh, it has to be fixed by bacterial species, and they fix that, they turn that into ammonia, which then can be used for all sorts of different uh, metabolic processes. And the reason uh, nitrogen is so important is because it really, it's a critical part of, of, of how our, how cells work, how biology works, parts of proteins, uh, DNA and RNA, as well as um, a number of the um, compounds that are biologically active in um, um, many herbicides and, and pesticides have, have nitrogen uh, in them as well. So, this is the slide that was kind of messed up, um, as you can see. And I'll try to use the pointer to walk through this. Um, basically, there, were, uh, there was an arrow going from the N2 here to the, uh, these red dots down here, which are nodules. So N2 is fixed by a leguminous plant, which is this green leafy plant here. And we can see there's a number of pathways that the nitrogen can then get to our cash crop. So crop residue can fall to the surface and start to decompose, as well as the roots and nodules will mineralize and become inorganic nitrogen in the soil, which then can be taken up by our, our crop plant. So uh, maybe after the seminar I can, I can send out a... Um, a, a real slide that depicts this because it's a nice little flow path of, of how we, we get nitrogen from our crop from our our leguminous crops or cat or cover crops to our cash crop. So here's the that N2 molecule that I was talking about. It's basically two nitrogens that um, that are bound together with three bonds, and that's uh, a large proportion of the atmosphere is nitrogen. And, uh, and like I mentioned, it's unavailable to most organisms because we don't have the capacity to internalize that. We breathe it, but we don't use it. Um, and I'll go over um, three, the three major groups of nitrogen fixers. That's associative nitrogen fixers, uh, phototrophic nitrogen fixers, and then I'll focus mostly on symbiotic nitrogen fixers down here. So the, the associative nitrogen fixers, um, they use um, carbon, sugar from um, things like decaying wood or, um, or sugars that are, are exuded by plants. Um, and uh, some of the species are Azospirillum, Burkholderia, and many of the tropical grasses have these 
types of associative nitrogen fixers, fixers associated with their roots. And let's we have some pictures uh, here. Oh, actually, we'll go. I'll go through this. The phototrophic uh, nitrogen fixers are are things like um, algae or cyanobacteria that are um, that are that grow in association with algae. Um, the uh, water fern, Azola, uh, utilizes these type these types of fixers in a in a semi symbiotic relationship, and they they have a capacity to both photosynthesize and fix nitrogen in either a single uh, organism or um, in a in an organism that has a symbiotic relationship. The um, and then the 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 true uh, symbiotic. Um, Nitrogen fixers are, are what we commonly know as legumes and rhizobia. And there's a number of different types of these types of um, symbiotic relationships. Um, both um, both your your typical rhizobia um, relationships as well as uh, actinorhizal uh, relationships. So let's look at the associative nitrogen fixers um, up here. We'll, I'll just give you a, a quick overview of them. These are these are bacteria that um, that are living on the roots of of non in many cases non leguminous plants. Uh, here's a picture of a corn root, and these are um, uh, azospirillum bacteria living on the root. And what they'll do is eat sugar and other um, energy molecules that are coming from the root and fix nitrogen uh, fix atmospheric nitrogen and turn it into um, ammonia and they they will um, leak this ammonia out and the, the plant can actually take it up so this is very uh, it's been shown to be a, a significant source of nitrogen in uh, systems such as uh, sugarcane um, down in Brazil they uh, where these associative end fixers can uh, can uh, account for uh, 30 to 40 percent of the of the plant nitrogen. Uh, here's a another picture, a close up, a scanning electron micrograph of again azospirillum on a corn root, and you can see that they they the bacteria themselves produce these strands of sticky protein and carbohydrate, and that literally sticks them to the root so they can stay close. To their uh, source of energy. So there, there's a lot of interest in associative nitrogen fixers, uh, fixers and, and there's um, there's some additional research that's going on that that may um, bring um, uh, bring some products to market that that will um, um, assist with non-leguminous plants um, benefiting from from nitrogen fix fixation on their root surfaces. So let's move on to the phototrophic uh, nitrogen fixers. Um, these are, like I mentioned, uh, some filamentous uh, cyanobacteria that can photosynthesize and fix nitrogen at the same time. They form these uh, specialized structures in which um, nitrogen gas can seep in, um, but it but it protects the cell from oxygen. And I'll get to that later about why oxygen is, is bad for nitrogen fixation. Essentially, oxygen is a, is a poison for nitrogen fixation. Um, like, I, like I mentioned in the first slide, there's some, uh, there's some systems in which uh, these uh, phototrophic nitrogen fixers are used. Um, in China, for example, uh, or in Asia in general, um, azola is grown in rice paddies. And this guy here is rototilling the azola. It's a, it's a, um, a flooded paddy. He's rototilling the azola and releasing a lot of the nitrogen that has been fixed in this plant. It's kind of like a, um, a biculture in this case. So let's move on to uh, symbiotic nitrogen fixation and this is um, the the nitrogen fixation that we commonly think of um, in temperate areas like the mid-atlantic region where we have crops such as soybean 
um, vetch, pea. Um, there's a number of, of different crops that are commonly used um, in this area. And we, we see the typical, um, uh, typical nodules here. If you've ever dug, dug up a soybean plant, you, you know what this is. And, uh, and in many cases, what, um, the way these organisms are introduced to the soil is through a, an inoculum. And so here we have um, some beans. On the left, we have um, um, just the naked bean. On the right, this is an inoculum that's been applied to the bean. Usually, it's the, the bacteria that's associated, that will associate with this plant, plus some uh, peat or something to keep, uh, keep the inoculum flowing, and then some, uh, some cases a surfactant of sort. And so you see that there's a, there's a clear um, benefit to having rhizobium associated with leguminous plants. In this case, the beans on the right uh, have rhizobium inoculated um, seeds, and the beans on the right, there was no rhizobium. And this picture in particular, uh, this was taken in Australia, where um, there, were, there were many, there's areas in Australia where legumes had never been grown before, and agriculture moved into those areas, and they were having terrible yields in their, in their beans and other legumes, and it was quickly realized that they were just the native rhizobia in, that, in those areas were not compatible with the species of plant that were being imported. So, um, so that was quickly solved by developing the proper inoculum for those, uh, for those beans. So here's a, a, a quick overview of, of the process of nodulation and, and which facilitates nitrogen fixation. And then I'll go into some more detail in, in just a minute. But um, we have to think of this. Uh, so we'll just go through this here, where we have um, this is the side of the root here. And these little hairs sticking out are root hairs. And those are, that's actually an, an extension of a single cell sticking out into the soil. And we've all seen these when we, if we dig up, um, uh, if we dig up a plant, we can see um, little tiny root hairs sticking out. And there's a, they're very important for nutrient uptake and water uptake. But they're also very important for associations with uh, symbiotic bacteria. So we have the bacteria around the root hair. They kind of cluster to the end of the root hair. And it starts to curl. And it's hard to see in this picture. I'll, get, I'll have another picture that is a lot better. Basically, we have uh, what's called an infection thread that, that moves through this root hair into the cortex of the root. And then, uh, then the nodule, as we know it, is formed. And I'll, I'll get into the details in just a minute. But I just want to point out here that this, that this point here is important. This is highly specific. So we have just a few bacteria that will associate with any one particular species of plant. We're starting to learn that, that the soil contains many, many, many kinds of rhizobia. And the, the type of associations may be a little bit broader than what we've originally thought. But for the most part, when we're looking at inoculum and other uh, types of um, uh, introduced rhizobia, we see a very specific relationship. And I'll get into that a little bit more in a second. So we have some, some pretty cool pictures here. I think they're cool, at least. And so we'll go, we'll, we'll go through the, the steps of, um, of nodulation in um, clover. Uh, and that's nodulation by rhizobium. So we have the rhizobium attached to the root hairs. And that's these little dots in here. Uh, so, so we have the rhizobium attaching to the root hair, and the, and the root hair itself curls around the rhizobium. And these little specks in here are the bacteria. We have um, very special enzyme production that causes a softening of the cell wall. And then we have 
the, the plant starts to build cell walls in, inside the root hair. So it kind of follows this path down the root hair. And you can see it in this second picture. This little thread is the plant. Um, I'm sorry, I see, um, I see that some people are still on the first slide. Is that? A general problem, or okay, I guess I guess some people are having some issues with it, but um, I'll just I'll continue here. So we have the root hair that has folded over and a thread being formed, and the and the and the plant actually creates a cell wall inside. It's kind of like a tube within a tube. So the bacteria travel down this this tube. And they never actually enter the plant. They're technically on the outside of the cell wall. About 20 or so bacteria will move down this path and move into the, into the cortex of the cell, of the root. And uh, the whole way, the plant is laying down fresh cell wall material the whole way uh, through. Um, let's see. Let's move on to the next one. Once the once the um, root the infection thread gets to the cortex of the cell, the nodule starts growing, and it emerges from the root um, and and forms what we commonly know as as nodules. So here we see um, this typical pink inside to the to the nodule. This, we'll get back to this later, but the next time you're out in the field and you pull up a legume, take your pocket knife out and slice open the nodules. And this is a really a, a neat way, kind of like a field test, to determine if your nodules are actually fixing nitrogen. If you see a pink inside that kind of looks like liver or something like that, um, that means that that nodule is fixing nitrogen. If you cut it open and see something like that, like a green inside, or if you see something that's just um, pure white, then that means the nodule has formed, but it's not fixing nitrogen. And I'll, um, kind of a neat little field test. I, I like doing that out in the field. And so we see here that nodules look different on different plants, um, and this morphology is controlled by the plant itself. So in cases where you have rhizobium that can infect two different types of plants, um, the, the size and shape of that nodule will be controlled by the plant itself. OK, so this, I think this picture is pretty neat. This is an a electron micrograph. Again, this is a, a single root hair. This is the end of a root hair. And so you imagine that's a projection out of a single cell of, of a root. And these bacteria up here are rhizobia attaching to the root hair. And I'll talk about this attachment in a second. But they use the same thing that we see in the, um, the associative nitrogen fixers, these little strands right here and here, and you can see them in here a little bit. Those are different types of carbohydrates or proteins that stick to the root hair. And that, that's where one part of the specificity of nitrogen uh, symbiosis, symbiosis of nitrogen fixers come in. These carbohydrates or proteins are very specific, and the rhizobia will not be able to stick to just any root hair. Um, it's kind of like a, a lock and key or a hand and a glove, so to speak. These, these proteins won't stick to non-compatible root hairs. So if we go, go to a more detailed um, description of how nodules form, we can see um, this, uh, so here we have the root hair. And we see that there's some free rhizobium in the soil. 
attaching to the attaching to the root. There's there's a, a small amount of random attachment just because bacteria can be sticky, but they will not hold on unless you have that lock and key situation, which is depicted right here. And hopefully everyone can can see this. So we see the root hair, the root hair here has the lock sticking out on the surface. And the rhizobium over here has the key sticking out on its surface. When there's the correct attachment, this, this sends a signal back into the root hair that says, OK, this rhizobium is the right rhizobium for us. Uh, and it's not until that lock and key get paired up. The root hair responds by starting to curl around the um, around itself, and it actually traps a few bacteria right at the uh, at the cro crook right there, and it stops growing at that point. What happens is it stops growing, but it starts producing the the cell wall inside. So this little area where the bacteria were. Um, folds in, and the and the um, the plant produces that infection thread, and it goes all the way down the root hair, and it goes into a very special cell right there in the cortex of the of the root. And like I said, this technically these bacteria are still outside of the plant, kind of like I guess you could think of like your your throat and your intestinal, <laughs> you know. It's, the, the the cell wall is being formed, and the bacteria are kind of marching down along here, and uh, and that cell wall is keeping them outside of the plant. Eventually, the root hair dies. The bacteria are inside of these special cells in the um, in the cortex of the root, and what they do is they get they get signals from the plant, the plant kind of takes over and and um, gives them information, or it's really chemical in information, that transforms them into these things called bacterioids. And the bacterioids are really, uh, they're rhizobia, which have been taken over by the plant. Um, the, back, the cells around the bacterioid begin to um, uh, multiply, and the bacterioids themselves can um, multiply within those cells. And then uh, the nodule is formed. And that's, that's the whole process. I think this is pretty, pretty amazing. This is the, um, the, one of the most elegant forms of symbiosis that we know of. And, um, and the whole time, this is occurring. There's communication between the plant, between the plant cell and the bacterioid that um, that control the activity of the bacteria in that in that cell. So here's a, another micrograph of this infection thread. So here's the end the end of the root hair. <coughs> Excuse me, and. The cell has laid down that cell wall, a tube of cell wall, <coughs> inside the root hair. Excuse me. And we can see the in, we can see bacteria just moving down this root thread, uh, this infection thread into the into the root. And here's uh, here's what is a is a cross section of uh, a root, and it kind of shows uh, the major phases of the of nodule formation. So here we have the root, the root hair, and the um, formation of that infection thread, and the bacteria moving in to the cortex of the root. These cells begin to divide, and they have the bacterioids inside of them, and they are they're functioning just like a part of the cell. Um, 
and in, in internal, and they're surrounded by. Uh, if you if you look at the surrounding of that bacterioid, it actually is very similar to what the outside of a plant cell looks like. So the plant is keeping them in a little um, a little jail, so to speak, uh, for the rest of their lives. And they um, these cells re reproduce. They oh no. So so. Going through, we see the um, the major uh, steps of nodule formation here. Uh, the, these these cortex cells are dividing with the bacterioids inside of them, and then the um, that division leads to uh, the nodule pushing out from the from the root itself. And you can see um, this these cells right here, the pink cells, are are very important in that these cells are kind of like the plumbing that link the nodule, they link the nodule back to the, the vascular system of the plant. So they they are the cells that transfer the nitrogen back into the plant so it can be used throughout the plant for uh, for leaf for chlorophyll production in the leaf, for seed um, protein loading everything that's, that is needed for the plant. So. I, I see one question about a bacterioid in a, in a vacuole type, and um, that, is, that is exactly what they're analogous to. It's kind of like a vacuole. It's a, li it's a little different in that there's uh, cell wall material surrounding the bacterioid, um, but it's very much like a, vac like a vacuole in the plant cell. And, uh, and that, that kind of touches on, if, if the audience is familiar with um, eukaryotic cells that have vacuoles um, and mitochondria and chloroplasts, those are thought to be once free living organisms that were internalized. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of chemistry occurring in these uh, in these nodules, and um, you don't have to you don't have to really um, understand all of this that's going on, but but the the general thing is that. Um, carbon is coming in from the plant in the form of sucrose. So sucrose is feeding the nodule. The nitrogen is coming into the nodule and being turned into ammonia. And then the nitrogen is leaving the nodule and going into the vascular system. So that's the main, the main thing to understand is that carbon in the form of sugar is coming in from the plant and nitrogen, uh, which is from the atmosphere, but then gets fixed by the bacterioid, that nitrogen is leaving and going into the plant. So that's the trade. It's kind of like an economy. The plant is paying in carbon, and the service they're getting is nitrogen. Um, the important thing here is that, like I mentioned before, oxygen is a poison for this process. And that's because oxygen can fit into these enzymes and stick there. And basically, it's like putting a monkey wrench in the, in the system. It stops the nitrogen fixation. Interestingly, the, the bacterioid will still consume carbon. And so if you have oxygen in this system, the bacterioid still will chew up carbon, but no nitrogen will be going back out. And then the plant gets very angry. <laughs> no, not angry, but uh, then the plant will do things to, to shut down the, the, um, the carbon flow to the nodule. OK, so there's a number of mechanisms to avoid oxygen. Um, the respiration rate uh, it can be very high, which just means the, the process of, of consuming that carbon 
also uses a little bit of oxygen. Um, and if that rate is very high, it just uses up all the any oxygen that might be in the in the nodule. Um, there's specialized cells which have um, impermeable membranes around them that allow uh, that have special um, channels for nitrogen, but not for oxygen. Um, the the cells can um, can participate in anaerobic metabolism, which basically means utilizing carbon without utilizing oxygen, which that's not as not as common. And then one of the most common ways to avoid oxygen in the nodule is um, by producing the plant will produce what's called leg hemoglobin, and this is very similar to the hemoglobin we have in our bloodstream that carries oxygen around for us. In this case, the leg hemoglobin is produced in the nodule, and that's what gives it that pink color in the middle. And that will scavenge, it will it'll bind up all the oxygen in the nodule and, um, and not bind the nitrogen. So. There's a number number of different mechanisms. This uh, this leg hemoglobin is probably the most common, and so you can see that that pinkish color in the nodule. That's um, that's the leg hemoglobin when it's bound to um, when it's bound to oxygen. It looks pink. There's a there's a manganese um, ion in the middle there. Uh, when the when leg hemoglobin is not produced, the middle of the nodule will look white. Um, let's see. Okay, so why don't why don't all plants fix nitrogen all the time, right? And the the uh, that's a rhetorical question, but the an the answer is um, because it's costly. It's it's expensive from the from the carbon standpoint, okay. Uh, the re the reason we we don't see nitrogen fixation occurring in say all legumes all the time is because it's costly. So this table here shows the gram of carbon per gram of nitrogen cost for either biological nitrogen fixation or nitrate assimilation. And so you can see there's a number of things here that are involved with nitrogen fixation uh, that cost carbon, and that's the production of enzymes, the um, uh, carbon metabolism associated with ammonia assimilation, transport of nitrogen, and then also the growth and the maintenance of the nodule itself. And that ranges from about three to six grams of carbon that are needed for every gram of nitrogen the plant gets. Whereas if you look at nitrate assimilation, um, we have thing, uh, processes such as nitrate uptake, um, the reduction of nitrate, um, ammonia assimilation, and the transport. That really only costs the plant about um, one to say, two and a half grams of carbon per gram of nitrogen. So it's fairly costly for the plant to perform nitrogen fixation, but it's extremely valuable in, in situations where the soil nitrogen is not um, high enough, not concentrated enough to support plant growth. And so that's why we see uh, situations like this where if, if this triangle here on the bottom is is depicting an increasing soil nitrogen pool when we have a very low concentration of nitrogen or very small pool of soil nitrogen the amount of nitrogen that gets fixed is very big so this arrow is very big if we 
are up here on this end of the spectrum where we have a very large soil nitrogen pool, the amount of nitrogen that gets fixed is very small. And that's because the plant will regulate how much nitrogen is, is being fixed and how much carbon it's allocating to those nodules. So basically, they, they turn off the spigot. If they're getting enough nitrogen from the soil, they'll turn off the, the spigot of carbon going into the nodule and basically shut it down. And so when we think about our um, fertility management, when we, uh, we I mean, at, at least on our, on our farm here, we, we rarely fertilize before uh, a legume. We may put a little starter down in some cases. But that, the reason we do that is because as you, ha as you increase your nitrogen additions, you're basically increasing this pool size and shutting down nitrogen fixation. So some of, the pro some of the projects that we work on are trying to understand how do we maximize nitrogen fixation while maintaining an adequate soil nitrogen pool. Um, so there's the factors that affect biological nitrogen fixation. That's what BNF stands for. Um, so uh, highly acidic soils will inhibit um, nitrogen fixation. It, it inhibits nodule formation in some cases because the the chemical signals between the rhizobia and the and the bacteria will will um, not work properly. Um, soil temperature can affect uh, nodule formation as well as nitrogen fixation. Um, some, uh, I, I mentioned a little bit about water availability. Uh, soil nutrients, there's a number of micronutrients like molybdenum and uh, boron and cobalt that are, that are needed for some of the very special enzymes that the bacteria uh, use. Competition between uh, compatible rhizobia and incompatible rhizobia will um, will also have an effect, uh, and then also uh, inorganic nitrogen will will inhibit the ability for the rhizobia to form nodules. Um, the plant basically does not allow the formation of the the, the curling of that root hair. Um, and then, and then, like I mentioned, the suitability, the, the, the type of rhizobia that's uh, needed w is very important. <clears throat> so I'll talk a little bit about inoculation. How uh, I should probably wrap up soon. Um, OK. So um, when do, do we want to inoculate? Okay. Um, uh, a large <clears throat> part of that decision has to do with the history of the, of the cropping system, uh, when you haven't had nitrogen, uh, when you haven't had a legume in the area for a while, um, <clears throat> if you have uh, uh, floods in an area, uh, persistent saturated soils, you may want to go back in and, and re-inoculate when the soils drain. Um, when, when the soil, when your soil analysis shows low nitrogen uh, uh, in general, uh, you you want to make sure that your your legume in the system has the has the best nitrogen um, uh, fixer compatible um, and present. So, and then, um, if you are if you are scouting, mm, mine's still working okay. here. Well, so so if you're scouting in the um, and you're and you're pulling up some legumes and um, doing that field test where you cut open a, a, a nodule and it's not pink inside. That means that you have rhizobium in the soil, but it may be an incompatible variety. So you, what you want to do is then inoculate. So if you see a large amount of nodules but very little evidence of nitrogen fixation. 
as doesn't nitrogen really start to decline with a pH of less than 6? Um, yeah, a, a availability uptake by the plant can decline. Um, but uh, the um, but when you, when the soils are very acidic, then the then nodule formation will be affected. Um, I, I hope that that answers the question. So so there's there's kind of two different things. You can have you can have nitrogen in, uh, unavailable at at um, low pH. Um, and that's unavailable to the plant, but then also if you have um, uh, low pH, you could have um, uh, interference with nodule formation. Um, the, the other question was inorganic nitrogen inhibits. Um, yes, if, and th in this case also, if you have um, high uh, inorganic N levels in the soil, you, uh, you inhibit nitrogen, uh, you inhibit nodule formation. Um, if, the, if the plant, if the nodules are already formed and you uh, fertilize, what will happen is the activity of the nodule will be shut off by the plant. Okay, so, um, so I alluded to the, to having the proper uh, rhizobia in the soil and that is a, um, that that can be a problem where you have large amounts of, of native rhizobia in the soil um, e that are either indigenous just in the soil or they're from a previous inoculant and um, and in some cases these can compete with the proper rhizobia um, and when when we talk about competitiveness this this is really the the ability of the rhizobia to um, to form nodules when there are other rhizobia that may have some of the same signals um, uh, being transmitted to the plant. Things about the uh, inoculations: um, you want to make sure that it's uh, inoculants that are that are compatible with the type of legume that you're going to be um, growing. Um, and all, and is competitive with the uh, with um, with native rhizobia in the soil. Uh, there's there's a, a range in in tolerance of rhizobia to environmental conditions, um, and then and then that tolerance also has to do with how the inoculum gets to you. So if it's prepared in uh, the Midwest, and it needs to get shipped out to to Maryland. You want to make sure that it's that it will be alive when it when it gets to you. Okay, so we can there many of the of the um, molecular biology aspect of of nitrogen fixation and the rhizobium themselves um, have been are starting to be figured out. So. Um, we we're at the point where we can really understand um, the compatibility between certain plant species and rhizobia, and um, and I would say we're really just reaching the point where we can start to um, develop more in, uh, improved rhizobia that may do a better job of of nitrogen fixation and specifically um, uh, more efficient nitrogen fixation. So they may use less carbon and cost the plant less per gram of nitrogen. Next, the next slide is really that I can finish there. Um, one thing that's not really considered when thinking about the efficiency of nitrogen fixation is that um, that for many, um, for many, many uh, years and generations, we've been um, breeding plant species for particular things like seed production or forage production and there really hasn't been a, a focus that a focus on um, breeding plants that that um, that optimize nitrogen fixation I mean it, this was done with soybeans and alfalfa but there's a whole range of, of other leguminous
crops and cover crops in particular, where there's been very little focus on looking at the, um, the genetic diversity within the plant species and looking at how that interacts with um, the efficiency of nitrogen fixation. So um, maybe with that, I'll just, I'll just uh, wrap up and